Avoiding the obesogenic chemicals, um, these endocrine disrupting chemicals in the meat supply. Uh, there's an obesity causing virus and poultry that may even be um, uh, playing a role. We're not sure. Theories keep coming. Here's the latest theory. Maybe it's to propionate. Right? After all, what's one of the one things that's only in plant foods? Fiber, right? Animals have bones to hold them up, plants have fiber to hold them up, right? Now we say, I thought fiber was defined as our inability to digest it, right? Well, true, we can't break down fiber, but the gazillions of good bacteria in our guts can. And what do they make with it? They make propionate, which gets absorbed into our bloodstream. So technically we can digest fiber, but just not without a little help from our little friends. So, but what does propionate do? Well, it inhibits cholesterol synthesis, that's good. It also appears to have what's called a hypophagic effect, meaning it helps us eat less by apparently slowing the emptying of our stomachs, um, which makes us feel fuller, longer. Propionate um, regulates food intake, or whether it's because it slows the generation of uh, new fat cells, but it results in this overall anti-obesity effect. Um, uh, so, um, and we can actually boost the populations of these good bacteria in our guts without taking probiotics, just by eating vegetarian, right? Because we're feeding our little friends with fiber. Animal foods also tend to be kind of calorically dense. For example, to walk off the calories found in a single pat of butter. You'd have to walk, add an extra 700 yards to your evening stroll that day. Right? Or a quarter mile jog to each sardine we put in our mouth. Right? And that's just the edible part. Right? And any who choose to eat two chicken legs better get out on their own two legs and go run an extra three miles that day to outrun weight gain. Right? And that's for steamed chicken, skin removed. Here's the latest. Meat consumption and prospective weight gain. Right? We're talking hundreds of thousands of men and women studied across 10 countries with weight gain measured over a five-year period. What did they find? Total meat consumption associated with weight gain um, in men and women. The conclusion is that uh, the, uh, um, the de decrease in meat consumption may improve weight management. And this was after for controlling for initial weight and physical activity, education level, smoking status, total energy intake. What? That's the kicker. This was after controlling for calories. Right? The link between meat and weight gain remained even after controlling for calories. Meaning you have two people eating the same number of calories, the one eating more meat may gain more weight. They even calculated how much more. Intake of 250 grams of meat a day, which is nothing for, uh, compared to what uh, the U.S. Um, eats, will lead to an annual weight gain of 422 grams higher than the weight gain experience with the same calorie diet with lower meat content. Right? After five years, the uh, weight gain would be about five pounds more. So same calories, yet five pounds heavier eating meat. And steak was nothing. The strongest relationship between annual weight gain was observed for poultry. Right? Let's say uh, you start out at a normal weight, eat a hamburger every day. Right? Well, this is how much extra weight you'd gain in addition to the calories that are present. Um, what, and if you ate the same number of calories instead of processed meat, like a ham sandwich with three slices of deli meat, you'd be up to here. And then half a chicken breast um, puts you up to here, again, above and beyond the calories. Right? In conclusion, our results indicate that meat intake positively associated with weight gain. This persisted after adjusting for energy intake and therefore um, we're in favor of this public health recommendation to decrease meat consumption for health improvement. Right. Uh, for more, make sure to check out the meat industry's take on this study, very interesting, um, as well as PCRM's uh, wonderful work trying to put a vegan diet um, to work in a corporate setting. Kidney failure, Eighth leading cause of death can be prevented with a plant-based diet, can be treated with a plant-based diet. Why? Because our kidneys are highly vascular organs, right? That's why kidneys look so red inside. Right? Our two little kidneys filter through our entire bloodstream. And so, if the standard American diet is so toxic 
to blood vessels in our heart, brain, and pelvis, leading to heart attack, stroke, sexual dysfunction. What might it be doing to our kidneys? Long story short, Harvard researchers found three significant risk factors for declining kidney function, meaning losing, you start to lose protein out of your urine. Your body's not supposed to be peeing out its protein. The three risk factors for declining kidney function were animal protein, animal fat, and cholesterol. It's not protein, it's not fat. Animal protein, animal fat. No relationship found with plant protein and plant fat. Not only do vegans appear to have better kidney function, but dramatic improvements were found treating kidney failure patients with pure vegetarian diets after just one week. Right. Leading killer number nine is people dying from respiratory infections. Um, so uh, check out my, um, my video, Kale and the Immune System, talking about the immunostimulatory effects of kale. Is there anything kale can't do? <laughs> and if you uh, look at my uh, video, Boosting Immunity Through Diet, which is actually, if you can see this, June 28th, this is just the video uh, of the day that went up on Wednesday, um, you can see that um, eating just a few extra fruits and vegetables can significantly improve one's immune response to pneumococcal pneumonia. Suicide is number 10. Now last year at Summerfest I talked about improving mood through diet. We know vegetarian diets were, have been associated with healthier mood states, but you don't know if it's cause and effect until you put it to the test. And that's what was done this year. You take regular meat eaters and you remove meat, fish, poultry, and eggs in this study from their diets. And you can see a significant improvement in mood scores after just two weeks. I mean, it can take drugs like Prozac, you know, months to take effect. In fact, the way drugs like Prozac work is they boost the levels of the so-called happiness hormone serotonin. Did you know that there, was, there is serotonin in plants. I had no idea, I certainly didn't. But there's serotonin and dopamine and all sorts of human neurotransmitters in plants. So much so, there's been a call to start treating depression with high content sources of serotonin. You know, like plantains, pineapples, bananas, kiwis, plums, and tomatoes, right? And what's the down, I mean, what's, what's the side effects? You got a little, seed stuck in your teeth or something? <laughs> Maybe that's why high intake of fruits, vegetables, mushrooms, and soy associated with decreased prevalence of depression. Maybe that's why improved behavior in teenagers was significantly associated with higher intakes of leafy green vegetables and fresh fruit. Uh, for more, uh, keep an eye out for my videos on the wrong way to boost serotonin, which is by these uh, tryptophan supplements, a better way um, to raise serotonin to fight uh, things like premenstrual depression, um, and, uh, and then the best way, um, as reported in this double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover study on the successful use of butternut squash seeds in the treatment of social anxiety disorder, for example. Amazing. How might a plant-based diet prevent systemic infections? Well, meat-borne bacteria can directly invade one's bloodstream through the intestinal wall or in women can creep up into their bladder. Just this month, June 2012, we have direct DNA fingerprinting proof, finally, right, that women eating meat are getting urinary tract infections from eating meat contaminated with fecal bacteria that then crawl up into their bladder. And chickens are the most likely reservoir. Wait a second, you can't sell unsafe cars, you can't sell unsafe toys. How is it legal to sell unsafe meat? Well, they do it by blaming the consumer. As one USDA poultry microbiologist said, meats, raw meats are not idiot proof. They can be mishandled and when they are, it's like handling a hand grenade. You pull the pin, someone's gonna get hurt. <laughs> See, if we get sick, it's our fault, right? Now, so while some may question the wisdom of selling hand grenades in supermarkets, <clears throat> 
The USDA poultry expert disagrees. Says, I think the consumer has the most responsibility, but just refuses to accept it. Right? It's like a car company saying, yeah, we installed faulty brakes, but it's your fault for not putting your kid in a seatbelt. Right? A director at the Centers for Disease Control responded famously to this kind of blame the victim attitude from the meat industry. Is it reasonable, she asked, if a consumer undercooks a hamburger that their three-year-old dies? Is that reasonable? Not to worry though, the meat industry's on it. All right, they just got FDA approval for a bacteria-eating virus to spray on the meat. <laughs> now, some have raised concerns about these so-called uh, bacteriophages, um, such as the possibility that these viruses can spread toxin genes between bacteria, which wouldn't go good, especially given the difficulties I mean, preventing large numbers of these viruses from being released into the environment from the slaughterhouses. Right. Now, it could also allow the meat industry to become more complacent about food safety, right? If they know they can just kind of spray some viruses on at the end, right? Similar to the quick fix argument about irradiation. From the industry point of view, right, who cares if there's fecal matter in the meats as long as you can just blast it at the end with enough radiation, right? Now, the meat industry's concern that consumer acceptance of these bacteria-eating viruses may present somewhat of a challenge to the food industry. Uh, not that they'd ever be labeled, of course. Um, but if they think that's going to be a challenge, check out their other bright idea. <laughs> the effects of extracted housefly pupae on chilled pork preservation. This is a sciencey way of saying they want to smear a maggot mixture on the meats. Now, it's a low cost, simple method, think about it. <laughs> Maggots thrive on rotting meat, yet there have been no reports of maggots having any serious diseases. Not that anyone's really checked, but I mean, right? indicating that they have a strong immune system, right? They must be packed with some kind of antibacterial properties, otherwise they, they die themselves eating rotting meat. All right. So, they took maggots that were three days old, washed them, dried them, kind of toweled them off, put them in a tissue blender, kind of a little Vitamix action there, and then, voila, safe for meat! <laughs> we did kidney failure, what about Liver failure. We've known for 35 years, since now you can't even see this, 1977, that a vegetable protein diet can be used to treat liver failure, significantly reducing the toxins that otherwise would build up eating meat with a less than functional liver, right? Imagine eating meat without, you know, uh, without a fully functioning liver to detoxify your blood. Right? I do have to admit, though, that some people living on plant-based diets have worsening liver function. They're called alcoholics. In fact, strictly plant-based, right? Uh, living on potatoes and corn and barley and grapes. Uh, yeah, still, however, not doing so hot. It's, uh, it's unclear. <laughs> High blood pressure is up next, so-called essential hypertension, essentially only found in those who eat meat. Again, look at this. We've known for decades, it's 1974 out of Hopkins, right? We've known that consumption of foods of animal origin highly significantly associated with blood pressure even after, again, the weight effects are removed, right? Fast forward 39 years to 2012 and compared to non-vegetarians, compared to meat eaters, as you get more and more plant-based, right? So, so meat eater to flexitarian, to just eating fish, to lacto -over vegetarian to vegan, looks what happens to hypertension. High blood pressure, right? There is this progressive reduction in risk to just a tiny fraction. See the same thing in diabetes. Here's diabetes, right? Again, the stepwise reduction of risk as one eliminates animal products um, on down. Right? And, uh, oh, and same thing with body mass index, right? Um, uh, as you can see, 
um, obesity rates get lower and lower. In fact, vegans are actually the only population on average that was not overweight. Even the vegetarians were overweight. All right. Diabetes, hypertension, leading causes of death. Is it going to take the medical profession another 39 years before we actually do something about it? How long does it take, being vegan, to bring blood pressures down? 12 days. Right? McDougall took 500 meat eaters, put them on a vegan diet over a span of 11 days. Uh, dropped their blood pressure 6%, about double that drop in those that were hypertensive to begin with. 14th leading killer, Parkinson's disease. Does a vegan diet reduce risk for Parkinson's disease? Good question. Well, we know that every single prospective study ever done on um, dairy products, milk consumption, and the risk of Parkinson's disease found increased risk of Parkinson's. Why? Well, one possibility is that dairy products in the United States are contaminated with neurotoxic chemicals. There's substantial evidence um, suggesting that exposure to pesticides may increase uh, Parkinson's disease risk. And these autopsy studies have found that the levels of these pollutants and pesticides in the brains of elevated levels in the brains of, of Parkinson's disease patients, and some of these toxins are present at low levels in dairy products. And they're talking about toxins um, like uh, tetrahydroisoquinoline, which is a Parkinsonism related compound found particularly in cheese. Now, although the amounts of this neurotoxin, even in cheese, are not very high, the concern is that they may accumulate, these neurotoxins may accumulate in the brain over long periods of consumption. And finally, uh, aspiration pneumonia, which is caused by swallowing problems due to Parkinson's or having a stroke or Alzheimer's, all of which we've already covered. All right, so where does that leave us? These are the top 15 causes of death, the top 15 reasons Americans die. And a plant-based diet can help prevent nearly all of them, can help treat more than half of them, and in some cases even reverse the progression of disease, including our top three killers. Now, there are drugs that can help too. Right? You can take one drug to treat uh, cholesterol every day for the, uh, the rest of your life, another drug for blood sugars, uh, a few more pills for, uh, for, your, for your blood pressure. Right? The same diet, though, does it all. Right? It's not like you know, one diet for this and then a different diet for this. Right? One diet to rule them all. <laughs> and what about drug side effects? Right? I'm not talking about a little rash or something. Prescription drugs kill more than 100,000 Americans every year. And I'm not talking about medication errors, not abuse, not overdose. We're talking, this is just deaths from side effects, so-called ADRs, adverse drug reactions to prescription drugs. Wait a second, 100,000 deaths a year? That means, let's go down the list, whoa, that means that the sixth leading cause of death in the United States is doctors. <laughs> the sixth leading cause of death is me. <laughs> Thankfully, I can be prevented with a plant-based <laughs> diet. Seriously though, um, uh, uh, compared to 15,000 American vegetarians, meat eaters had about twice the odds of being on aspirin, sleeping pills, tranquilizers, antacids, painkillers, blood pressure medications, laxatives, and insulin. Right? So, so plant-based diets are great for people that don't like taking drugs, don't like paying for drugs, um, and of course don't like risking adverse effects. Right? Now this study did show that plant-based diets have their own side effects. Side effects include a lower risk of chronic disease, fewer allergies, fewer surgeries, we're talking, um, uh, fewer varicose veins and hemorrhoids, even fewer hysterectomies. Um, and we're not talking just the big killers, right? Not just less heart disease, cancer. This is the longest study on vegetarians in human history. Uh, not just uh, less heart disease and stroke and high blood pressure and diabetes, but less diverticulosis, less, if you can read this, less um, diseases overall, right? That's the side effects of a plant-based diet, less disease overall. 
Here's the allergies thing. Again, longest running study on vegetarians in history. Women who eat meat compared to vegetarians appear to have a 30% greater risk of uh, reporting chemical allergies, 24% um, uh, asthma, more uh, drug allergies, even more bee sting allergies, 15% um, more hay fever. A new side effect of plant-based diets we just learned about last year, fewer cataracts. Right? That's what we get. Fewer cataracts, the leading cause of blindness and vision loss. Compared to those just eating a single serving of meat a day, right, in one meal, those eating half a serving a day um, dropped the risk 15%. Um, uh, just eat fish, dropped about 21%, get rid of fish, drop 30%, get rid of eggs and dairy, full 40% drop in risk. And that's all in addition to my favorite side effect of plant-based diets, helping to prevent 15 out of our 16 top killers. Want to solve the healthcare crisis? I've got a suggestion. Imagine if our nation embraced a plant-based diet. Right? Imagine if we just significantly cut back on meat. Well, there's actually one country that did it. After World War II, Finland joined us and started packing on the meat, eggs, and dairy. And by 1970s, the mortality rate from heart disease of Finnish men was the highest in the world, even put us to shame. So, look, they didn't want to die, so they got serious. Heart disease is caused by high cholesterol. High cholesterol is caused by high saturated fat intake. So the main focus of the strategy was to reduce the high saturated fat intake in the country. So uh, this means uh, here that's uh, cheese, chicken, uh, cake, and pork, basically. All right. So a berry project was launched to help dairy farmers switch to berry farming, right? whatever it took. And indeed, many farmers did switch from dairies to berries. They pitted villages against each other in these friendly cholesterol-lowering competitions to see who could, who could do the best. All right, so how'd they do? All right. look, look, on a population scale, even if mortality rates drop, you know, 5%, I mean, that could save thousands of lives, right? But remarkably great changes took place. In 80% drop in cardiac mortality across the entire country. 80% drop in heart disease deaths. With such greatly reduced the rates of cardiovascular and cancer mortality, the all-cause mortality was basically almost cut in half, leading to um, seven more years, uh, men living seven more years, six more years for women. Right? And uh, look, this is just cutting down on animal products. Now vying for the world record for heart disease deaths, of course, the United States of America. So why doesn't our government make these same recommendations? Uh, well, you know, I've got this whole series of videos on the conflicts of interest within the U.S. Dietary Guidelines Committees. They're the ones that make the recommendations, right? Um, and indeed, whether they're funded by candy bar corporations or the Sugar Association, right? or a member of uh, McDonald's Council on Healthy Lifestyles, <laughs> serving on Coca-Cola's Beverage Institute for Health and Wellness. Um, and notice, uh, we only know about this thanks to a PCRM lawsuit against the USDA. Very impressive. Very good. One committee member um, uh, served as the Duncan Hines brand girl and then as the Crisco brand girl. These are the folks, all right? Dictate U.S. nutrition policy, right? If you read the official dietary guideline recommendations, you'll note that there is no discussion at all of the scientific research on the health consequences of eating meat. Why? Because if the committee actually discussed this research, it would be unable to justify its recommendation to eat meat at all. As the research would show that meat increases the risk for chronic diseases, contrary to the purpose of having dietary guidelines in the first place, right? <laughs> Thus, by simply ignoring the research, the committee is able to come to a conclusion that would otherwise look improper, right? All right, all right. Um, you know, so they can't even talk about the science. Right. We know that a plant-based diet, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, no meat, 
um, reverses heart disease, completely prevents death from heart disease, slows the progression of cancer, and the almost identical diet promoted by the World Cancer Research Fund to prevent cancer based on the largest review of scientific studies to death uh, to date. But again, right, they can't even talk about the science um, because how could they justify anything but a plant-based diet? Let me end with was probably the best summary of nutrition policy in the United States that I've ever seen. The new dietary guidelines have been released. Right? They tell us to eat healthier, but not as healthy as to noticeably affect any corporate profits. <laughs> Thank you very much. Don't forget to check out my new video every day. Please share the site with friends and family. Um, uh, buy them all DVDs, all proceeds to charity. And remember, please feel free to stop by for a free cholesterol check. See everybody there. Thank you, Dr. Gray.